And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. Now, a lawyer is only going to answer, ask a question that he already knows the answer to. He's just asking the question so that he can find out what they think about it, what their answer to it is. A certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he pretty much knew what he thought, but he was looking to see what Jesus would, thought, would think. He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So Jesus turns back and says, What do you think Scripture says? What, what's your understanding of what you think Scripture says? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. What we're really going to talk today about is what it means to do this so that we can live. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us. And the, Lord, the, the chance today. We want, Lord, we want to be centered on your word. We don't want it to be our word. God forbid, we want it to be your word. But Lord, we know that your word never comes back void. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, draw us to your word. Teach us the truths that come from it. So Lord, that we can have a greater understanding of you, a greater vision of you, so that we can seek you more, so that we can be drawn close and that we could be so very well blessed. May you do that. Lord, I can't, but you can. Do it today, in Jesus' name, and in your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I have always been interested in how our brain works, the workings of the brain, how, why we tick, why we do the things that we do. As a Christian, I, I have in my spirit, I have in my heart's desire to do certain things, but I don't always do it. And I'm not, I know you're not shocked by that because you know that I don't always do it. And, and guess what? I know that you always don't do the things that you already know either. How many of you, you know, I know you do. There's a whole lot of this that is the word of God, that is truth that we need to be, uh, seeking and doing in our life. There's a whole lot of this that we're not doing. That would have been a great amen moment, right? It, there, there's a whole lot to this that we haven't quite grasped yet. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll sh <coughs> share with you what Paul says in Romans 7. In Romans 7, verse 15, I've always been intrigued by this verse. It says this, For what I am doing, I do not understand. That would be another good place for an amen, wouldn't it? I don't know why I'm doing all the things that I do. I don't know why all the things that come out of my mouth come out of my mouth. I don't know why the looks that I give, I always give. I don't know why I'm always doing some of the things that I'm doing. Look what else he says in that verse. For what I will to do, what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, and that's a strong word, he said that I do. The things that my heart's desire is, I don't find that I do that very often. But the things that I don't like, the things that I don't want to do, the things that I absolutely would say that I would run a thousand miles away from, those are the things that I find myself doing. And you ask yourself the question, why? Why do we do that? How is it that I can be in such a good moment, in such a good place, and, and venture off and jump off a cliff so quickly? How is it that I can be so intrigued by the good and love and joy and peace and ready to kick somebody and run them off the road and, and, and do it in a matter of moments. You know, one of the things that uh, intrigued me, uh, you're, you're going to probably uh, uh, wonder about this, but the scientists, the neuroscientists and, the, and, and all those people that, that study our mind, they, they tell us that we have four billion unconscious thoughts per second. Well, there's a lot of things I don't think about, but I'm grateful that my brain does. I don't know how all these organs that I have in my body, uh, they're, they're all doing what they're supposed to be doing, and they're all interconnecting with each other. My heart keeps be beating, and 
the lungs keep going and, and all these neurons keep firing them. All these things keep happening and I'm not thinking, all right, now, heart, keep beating. Right? Lungs, <sighs> have another breath. I think I need another breath here pretty soon. Breathe again. <sighs> I don't have to think about those. Four billion unconscious thoughts, all these things that are going on. And by the way, you never stop thinking. A couple of weeks ago when I was saying at the end of our day, it would be good if we could clear our mind. Really what I meant was to change our focus. I was saying, get all the other stuff out of the way and just hear the voice of God. You can do that, but you're never going to stop thinking. Even when you're sleeping, you're still thinking. And I'm grateful for that, right? Because I still need my heart beating. I still need the lungs working. I still need all those things going on. Lynn elbows me in the middle of the night. My brain's going to say, hey, did you feel that, right? Probably means I was snoring or something like that. I don't know. She just says it was by accident, you know, something like that. She's going to get mad at me because she actually doesn't say that to me. Sorry, Lynn. She's up in the balcony watching me, giving me that lovely Lynn look. Love you too. That was for free. Now i got to bring you back because I just lost all of you. You're out. I can't believe he did that, right? Why do you do the things that you do? I don't know why I just did what I did. It just comes out that way. All these things happen, and, and the thing that, that is the problem is things happen to us that are bothersome. Let me make this statement. What happens to you and what happens in you doesn't have to be the same thing. I'm going to say it again. What happens to you? There's some ugly things that happen in life. Some rude things, some mean things, some difficult things, some hard things. Hurt people will hurt other people, right? There are some things that will happen to you, but then what happens in you that is your reaction to it? They don't have to be the same thing, right? Somebody pokes you in the eye. I mean, you may want to immediately poke them back in the eye, right? Someone hits you on the cheek, what do you want to do? You want to hit them back. But God's Word says, no, no, no. When they hit you, your reaction to it, what happens in you, doesn't have to be the same as what they did to you. So you can turn the other cheek and say, you enjoyed that so much, why don't you do it again? Right? Oh, yes, that's right. But we have trouble with that. You see, sometimes... This is what happens. We take the environment. We take all the things that are around us that happen to us, and that shapes our mind. That shapes our thinking. When those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord say we've got a higher calling on our life, take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 2. You can keep your finger in Luke 10. We're going to come back to it, but I want you to look at Luke Two, I mean, excuse me, Philippians 2. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is in Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Think this way. Which was also in Christ Jesus. I want you to think the way Jesus thought. Now, Jesus was the Son of God, amen? 100% God, but He left heaven... He emptied himself of some of the glory that was there because he couldn't, we, we couldn't stand him on earth if he had the full glory that he had in heaven and he actually has now in heaven. But he allowed himself to be born human to Mary in Bethlehem. So the Son of God actually became the Son of Man too so that he could go through life like we go through life. And things happen to Jesus. People did things to Jesus. People tried to influence Jesus. Satan tried to influence Jesus. But you see, what happens to us and what happens in us doesn't have to be the same thing. Jesus had something else that he was leaning on, the truth of God. And if you're a Christian, he wants us to do the same thing. Let this mind, let this way of living, let this way of thinking be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So if Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, had all of this in him, 
And when you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, and you invited that in, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that led him and guided him and helped him and empowered him is the same Holy Spirit that's in us. You can have the same thinking Jesus has. He wants you to have the same thinking that guided him and led him. Matter of fact, you have the same source. Are you with me there? I mean, we all agree with that. Can we say amen? Well, let's, what does that fully mean? Look in Philippians 2 back in the first verse. Therefore, basically everything he was building on in chapter 1, he says, <clears throat> if there is any comfort or consolation in Christ, those of you who know Jesus, do you find any comfort in knowing Jesus? Shake your head. I want to hear the rattling. If I can't get an amen, I want to hear the rattling. Is there any comfort in knowing love? Is there any fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Are you blessed and overwhelmed by what I say many times in my prayers? God, come and put your arms of love around us and draw us close. And by the way, he can do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. When that peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, all that comes in your heart. Is there any fellowship with the Spirit? Are you blessed because of the Spirit of the living God? He says, any affection. You feel the affections of God, of goodness? What about mercy? When you don't get what you deserve? I mean, you, you deserve to be, when, when, when we sin, we're far from God, right? Oh, no. His mercy allows us to come in, and we don't get what we deserve. We get better than that. We get a relationship with him. He says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Think the way I do. If there's, if there's love in Christ, if there's comfort in his love, if there is uh, fellowship in the Holy Spirit, if you find great affection, if you, if you find great mercy, then the greatest joy that he has is the joy that you'll get by thinking the same way. Have the same love. Be of one accord. Listen, Satan always attacks relationships. Don't be, don't be surprised by that. Divide and conquer what, what is what he wants to do. If you feel inclinations in you that, that, that will separate you from someone else rather than draw close to them, that's not of God. He wants us to be of one accord, of one mind. That's his thinking. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. It's not how you think, what you want, what you feel, how you think it betters you. No, no, no. He says there's something bigger than that. But in lowliness of mind, humility of mind, lower how you think because there's something greater that we need. In lowliness of mind, let each, each and every one of us, may we esteem or lift up others better than ourselves. Let each of you Look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. You can look back in Luke 10 if you want. You say, preacher, that's good preaching, but I, I don't know, that, that sounds pretty hard. Well, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. In Luke 10, let's go back to the scripture. The lawyer asked the question to Jesus, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what's God's word say? Well, He's, he, he was quick to quote uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Verse 4 said that there's one God and one God only that you should serve. Verse 5, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. That's the Shema. It was so important to the Jewish people that when their kids were real little, when they, you know, I'm sure the first words were mommy, Right? After that, daddy maybe came in second place. Maybe food. I don't know. Whatever. Some of us are different. But the first thing that they would teach them was this, the Shema. They wanted their kids to know right off the bat that, that, that the greatest thing in all of life is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and with all your mind. And then... This attorney also quoted Leviticus 19, verse 18, that you would love your neighbor 
as much in the same way that you love yourself. Jesus said, hey, that's a good thing. He said, you have answered rightly, do this, and you will live. Jesus is saying to us, you need to think in a God way. You need to value God. That's what the word love means. Cherish God. Lift him up high with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And you're saying, I don't know about that. Sounds pretty tough. Sounds pretty difficult. Hey, guys, let's take a trip. Y'all with me? Let's go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Now, for the rest of this sermon, I might just say the garden, but when I say the garden, I'm talking about the Garden of Eden. Y'all remember Genesis 1 and 2? And you remember that God created all those things, but then he made a, a habitation and he put man there, right? And he put Adam there and he didn't want Adam to be alone, so he created Eve to be with Adam. And they became one flesh. They became together. We need each other. Can I, have y'all ever, I'm going to throw this at you. Y'all ever heard of the, the term soulmate? Keep, hold on to that word. We're going to talk more about it in just a minute. All right? Helpmate. They were there for each other. They were better because of the other person. I would be half Brian if it were not Lynn completing me. And I hope and pray that, that the areas in her life, I can help complete her and she can complete me and we can be one flesh together. We can be better together than we were apart. God made us that way, right? But when he put them in the Garden of Eden, it was good. Y'all smile real big. I mean, was it pretty? I mean, the beautiful grass, beautiful trees, all the flowering trees that were there and the bushes and and the berries, and, and it was all good, and it was wonderful. And look, there was, there was no sin. I mean, their hearts were complete. God made them that way. Everything was good. All the time, everything was good because they had the mind God gave them, and it was perfectly wor working in that circumstance. But then another distraction came in. Another word came in and spoke to them. And they thought about it. And then they, you know, I, I feel, and then they made a choice. And it was called sin. Thinking, feeling, choosing. That is what science defines as the mind. The mind. When they talk about the, the mind today, they talk about it in two parts. They talk about the mind and they talk about the brain. The mind is wired for optimism. The brain is wired for for love. So in your brain, the desire of your brain is love, security, health, belonging. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they had all of that. All they knew was love. They had full security. They belonged there. They were fully at health, not only physically, yes, physically, but also emotionally. Spiritually, they were perfect that was there. But when sin came in, it entered the mind. Hold on. Satan came in and said, hey, why don't you do this? Thinking, they thought about it. Feeling, well, if I do this, then I can be like God. Choosing, I believe I will. And it was sin. What God built that worked in the Garden of Eden, an outside influence came in and changed it. The Bible says in the New Testament, to know to do right and not to do it 
to him it is sin. So all these things that happen to us, we know what's right. Like Romans 7, 15 told us, what I do, I don't understand. For what I want to do, I don't do. What I hate, that I do, right? This outside, outside influence will come in. It comes into our mind, our thinking. And then it makes us feel a certain, we feel a certain way about it. Then we choose. And if we don't choose like God, we sin. And we feel the effects of it. Science calls today the mind the hard question. Of science, you talk about any, go to any place, any university, any place that they're studying science. You 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 read any book about it. I always love reading books about this because it's very intriguing with me. But they'll always make the same quote: the the mind is the hard question of science. It's hard for them because they don't understand it the way we do. You see, they think that you're just thinking, and then when your thinking stops. I mean, that's the only thing that goes in is you're thinking when your thinking stops and life's over and that's it. Hold on. There's more to it than that. What was the Shema? Love the Lord your God. We'll get to that more in a second. With all your heart, soul, strength, your mind. Y'all listen to me now. All four of those are the same thing. It's just different aspects of your mind. I'm going to say it again. Heart, soul, mind, strength. All the same thing. If you have a vantage point, look right here. And you're looking at it from the north. You're looking at it from the east. You're looking at it from the south. You're looking at it from the west. You have four different vantage points, but it's the same thing. Your heart is how you feel about something. Your soul is that life Spirit that is within you. Your strength is your passion that fulfills your feelings. And your mind is that thinking that creates the feeling, that creates the choice of what you do. So literally, when it says that we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength... What he is saying is your thinking needs to be pointed towards God. That's what Paul was talking about in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Well, how does that work? All right, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Y'all back to the Garden? How did it look inside the Garden? Was it good? I mean, it was wonderful. Everything was wonderful. Everything was good. Everything brought praise, glory, and honor to the Father. He built it that way. That's the way he wanted it. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? In our minds today, we're going to call that, are you ready for this? Wisdom. Wisdom. Okay? But when they sinned, they got kicked out of the garden. So outside of the garden... There were also trees out there. Some of them were really got nice trees. There were bushes and plants and really nice ones. But then there was also thorns and thistles and poison oak. By the way, y'all better kill it while you can. Because it's springtime, it's coming. You better kill those bad thoughts while they're coming too. You see, not only were there good trees, there were some broken trees. Matter of fact, there were some toxic trees. There was a jungle out there. There was quicksand. There was mosquitoes. I don't believe there was mosquitoes in the Garden of Eden, do you? If they did, they didn't pick on Adam and Eve. I don't know. But hear me. Hear me well. In our mind, the inner part of our mind, the brain that is the brain that is formed for love, has these outside influences that come into our mind, our thinking. Then we start thinking about it. Then we think, well, I think I feel. And then we choose. We don't always choose well. Sometimes some people say, well, 
I don't have, feel very loved. Ugly things happen to us. I don't think, I don't really feel very beautiful. How many of y'all have ever seen a little child and you look at them and you just say, oh, you're so beautiful? No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. You're the most beautiful thing in the world. It doesn't matter what the parent says. It's how that child feels. Something's happened to that child. And they no longer see themselves as loved. That's the opposite of the brain. There's another thinking that's coming in. Security. How many of y'all like security? Everybody does. We're built for that. But when you try to find security in what you own and how much money you have and how many degrees you have on the wall and, and how good a job you have and how many people like you and how many people like you on Facebook and how many people think you're the greatest thing. And if that becomes how you view yourself, you're going to lose your security and you're going to become very insecure. Healthy. I mean, there's some toxic stuff that goes on in this world. Mark and I were talking this morning about social media. Some of y'all know about TikTok. I was on TikTok for two days. I wanted to look at it, see what it was. I couldn't stand it after two days. I, did, I heard so much cussing. And I, I want to tell the parents, you need to get your kids off that. We were talking, I was talking with some preachers this week. Ten of us were talking about social media in the church. And there's a few of those social media outlets there's no way in the world I would have. No way in the world. Because if I wanted to follow them and then all of a sudden they started getting pornography in, we'd have nothing to do. But I promise you, you get TikTok, there's going to be some little girl looking for security, taking her clothes off. And I just want to yell at them and say, no, put your clothes on. Keep them on. You may think you have to do that so that you can be liked. And I'm telling you, you're just fine. What we're finding in society today, that the rate of these outside influences coming into our life are worse than they've ever been. Our mind was built for optimism. What we're hearing is complete, com complete and total negativity. So you find people and you're around them and all you hear is negativity. Negative about this, negative about this. I'm telling you, it began in their thoughts. Other things happened, and they're reacting out of the negativity. What happens to you and what happens in you doesn't have to be the same thing. You hear me? In our brain, there's that inner part there. Oh, it's in the garden, it's good. We can meet with God and we can, it can be great and wonderful. But in the outside influences of the world, God help us. What he's telling us is that we need to change our thinking. Thinking breeds feeling, we, how, what we feel about it. Feeling breeds the choices. But I don't want to make my choices based on the talks toxic things that are out there. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, in the Sermon on the Mount, y'all listen to me? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your value system. What you value, that's where your heart's going to be. So if you value money, all your decisions, all your feelings are going to be based on that. Today, physical health, how people look at that is overriding everything else. It starts in how they think about it, what this person's saying about it, and what that person's saying about it. And you can do this. You know, I heard a, one of the church members, we had a, a cleanup day yesterday at church. We had about 20 people show up, and, and it was a great day, Phil. Phil did a great job. I, but I heard one of them talk about it. They said they, they listen to this news station, and then they flip over to this news station, and they're telling the same news, but they're telling it with two different vantage points, right? 
There, there's, there's this that's telling you one thing, but there's something else that's telling you something else. We need to grow deaf to what the world says. We need to start tuning in to what God says. The word love, agape in the New Testament, means to see something and to find value in it and treasure it and cherish it, listen now, more than anything else. There is nothing that can compete with that. It is the greatest of the great. I will tell you, the things of God are what we need to be treasuring, what we need to be chasing after, seeking. We're not there yet, but every day we get the opportunity to draw closer to God and the blessings that He has for us. Oh, I, I buried the lead. Don't you just hate it when you're supposed to start with something and you, you, you put it in like... I just started a new sermon series called No Greater Love. That's what all this is about. We're going to talk about it for the next week. I want to tell you the greatest love is the love that God has for us. When God created us, He created a capacity within us to fully know love, to fully know joy, to have a peace that goes beyond all understanding. Now, in God's creation, there were other things that he created, but they, they chose to go in other directions. The Bible says one-third of the angels didn't follow God. But you know what he did with us? He put the seed in us that wanted a relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit says, this is what you need. This will satisfy this will take care of you. This will show you what real love is. This will let you know what belonging and security is. You don't have to follow that. You can just totally disregard that. You'll find happiness here. And one day, Brian's going to say goodbye to this world. I'm going to breathe my last. My heart's going to stop beating. The Bible says absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. I'm going to let the earth go, be, go beyond and I'm going to fly away and I'll be home in heaven. Home forevermore. I was created for that. The Holy Spirit came in my heart and life and drew me to that. Now here's the difference. Those angels were always in the presence of God and took it for granted. But I was born with a sin nature. And I had to live with the consequences of that sin. And I learned from that. And I desired Him. And I want Him more than anything else. And I'm still a sinner. But I'm, I'm pointed towards heaven. I'm pointed to God having all of his, all access to my heart and my life and my soul and my strength. And one day, I'm going to get the gift of never having an outside influence again. Come on now. Never having an evil thought again. Never having to listen or be swayed by insecurity or hatred or negativity, never again. I'll be home because my heart and my life will be right, fully, complete in Him. But until then, He is saying, think on me. Feel about me, how I truly am, and choose me. Choose me. Now, He's not going to force you to do that. If a person today does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord, and they do not want to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord, God's not going to force them to get saved. God's not going to force them to go to heaven forever and spend eternity in joy and peace and love. He's not going to make them happy. If they don't want that, they don't have to have that. By the way, if you are a Christian, you're not there yet. So you have to choose it today. You better be thinking about Him. Because that's going to tell you how you view, 
how you feel and the choices that you make. See, how many times have we looked at this? Oh, I'm supposed to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I can never do that. I have. I've said that. But here's the thing. He's fit me for that, and I can't. I just have to learn to say what to say no to and what to say yes to. And one day, he's going to let me graduate. And he's going to take me home. And there I won't ever have to deal with it ever again. I was built for more. Matter of fact, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, my heart breaks for you. Whether you're in this room today or whether you're watching online, my heart absolutely breaks for you because you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're missing. All your heart. All your soul. When I said soulmate, you know who my soulmate truly is? It's not Lynn. It's Jesus. She's my helpmate. But my soulmate is Jesus. With all my passion, with all my strength, you can have so much more. All you need to do is just believe in Him. Turn from the things that separate you from God, your sin. Tell Him that you need His help. Ask Him to come into your life and save you. He will redeem you. He will make you new. He'll give you the gift of eternal life with Him. And you get to walk it out every day.